Greatness is found in pure hearts that love Jesus Christ. Hello, as promised, we're coming to you from my office, and it's Monday. I hope that you had a wonderful night of rest. It certainly was an amazing day of worship. Went home very satisfied uh, with just the heartbeat and everyone's response. Maybe some of you noticed that I had disappeared kind of quickly afterward. I wore myself out pretty good after that message, but then I also just wanted Christ to have all the emphasis. And so... I knew that I had done what he wanted me to do, and so then I just kind of pulled back. If you had stuck around long enough, I was there, and I was talking in the basement to folks for a while and then made my way upstairs. But if there was something you wanted to say to me, I do apologize. Wish I could have connected with you, but I'm satisfied with the day that we had. There are just a couple of things that I want to take care of before we dive into the things that happened for Jesus and the disciples on Monday. A uh, pretty special day today and an exciting day. Um, but before we dive in... Uh, someone afterward, as I was talking, fellowshipping with folks, someone said, you didn't mention the, the cross on the donkey. And I just had a completely blank look. I had no idea what they were talking about. So I said, it, was there a donkey that had a cross? And like, oh, pastor, you have to look it up. So we were talking about it. And so I did. Uh, someone sent me a link um, and I dug in just a little bit and I was so surprised to find maybe you're watching this. I, from what I understand, it went around on Facebook, but I'm not on Facebook, so I didn't know this. Um, but apparently there is a cross that is on every donkey's back. They call it the Jerusalem donkey. Um, and there is a cross on the back. There's a legend um, um, about a donkey who wanted to carry the cross for Jesus. And so there's a story that's kind of been attached to it, which we know isn't, it, it didn't actually happen. Scripture probably would have told us. But I have no doubt that if the creator who makes all things allowed himself to be carried by a donkey uh, in preparation for his crucifixion, that God didn't lay a cross on the back of every donkey to remind us of what he did for us. And then that charge for us, that as we serve him, to take up the cross and follow me. What an awesome thought. If you didn't watch the message yesterday, please go back and watch it. You were challenged in that message uh, from scripture to be that little cult that Jesus used and how that one touch from Christ completely changed that animal and how we've been called to carry Christ and the significance of that. And so take up your cross and follow me. Really, really awesome thought. And to that person, you know who you are that mentioned it to me, to the ladies that I was talking to. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Pretty special. I know Pastor Matt has thrown up an image for you to see if you didn't know about it. Uh, I mentioned it to Cherry, and she said, yeah, I saw it on Facebook a few years ago. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known about it. And then she said that she had taken the kids to um, kind of like a farm-type place for interacting with kids uh, here in Ray Township. And they had a donkey there, and she remembered hearing that. And so she checked, and sure enough, that donkey had the cross on it. And the other thing that's special is it's unique to every single donkey. No cross on their back is the same, almost showing you the intention that the master had and allowing that to be on its back. So wanted to mention that to you, something we could have thrown in the message yesterday, but unfortunately I didn't know about it till after the sermon. Um, the second thing that I wanted to point out, I had told you that there was a nugget that I had left out. I just wanted to encourage you. If you're at the building, um, I'm sure you had a different experience than those that were online. And by the way, I had someone reach out to me and say, oh, pastor, we really would have been there if we could. And they were sick and I knew it. And so I said, no, no, the comments that I made about coming back to the building, they don't, it's not for people that are sick. If you're still sick or dealing with illness, yes, we don't want you to come to the building. You need to stay home. Uh, that was more of just an encouragement. Uh, if fear has kind of changed and dominated the way that you're living your life because of the pandemic, come back to the building. And there was just a little nugget there that I thought was so good. So Jesus stayed outside of Bethany. And I made a point during the message and I talked about how our building is located at 27 Mile Road. And that Bethany was about two miles outside of Jerusalem. So it would be like walking up to the four-way stop at 29 Mile Road. So a little bit of a distance, really. You think about walking that, you know, that's a half hour, 45 minute walk. If you're walking 15 minute, uh, 15 minute mile 
it's a half hour to 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer than that with the disciples based on terrain. Um, and so it's a little bit of a walk to get into town. Um, but I want to point out who he stayed with. Here Jesus knows that he's going to die, and he's going to prove that to us throughout the week. And he spends his time with Lazarus. Lazarus is the only man that he knew who had tasted death and lived. And I have no doubt that Christ was able to be encouraged by being with Lazarus, knowing that he would taste death, but that the resurrection was going to happen. And so I'm sure Lazarus was... Uh, an encouragement to Jesus as he was getting ready to die on the cross. Something I had never noticed, something that I had never heard pointed out. And I think it just speaks to how important it is that we are together. Uh, I think it's dangerous to try to do it on your own or be by yourself. We need one another because we encourage each other. And when you're with a church family, you are with a group of people that are also imperfect as you are, who are struggling as you are, who also desire to love Jesus like you do. So if I can encourage you, don't ever forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, as the book of Hebrews says. So those are the two little items that I wanted to take care of. Uh, if you have your Bible, uh, let's go ahead and start in John chapter 12. Uh, this will kind of wrap up what happened on Sunday, and then that'll move us into the book of Mark where we'll take a look at Monday. So if you have your Bible, go to John chapter 12. We'll wrap up yesterday. There's just a little phrase here that I didn't read as part of the message that I thought was so interesting. And it gives you just a feel for what's going on with the city as well as the animosity that's building toward Jesus. And so leading up to it, um, people know what it, what's happened with Lazarus. And it's one thing to do miracles. He had done them for three years, but he raised Lazarus from the dead. And if you can do that, you're not just helping people live a better life for as long as they're able to live. But if you can unravel death, you are now doing something no king has ever been able to do for his people. And so there is uh, obviously a lot of self-interest over this thought. He truly is the savior. If he can keep me from, from ever dying, I die and then he just calls me out of the grave. He really is the most powerful. He can overcome death. And so people were very excited about that. In John chapter 12, verse 18, it says, For this cause the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle, talking about Lazarus raising from the dead. And verse 19, don't miss verse 19. John chapter 12, verse 19, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. They're talking to each other and like, Man, we tried, but we have not won. This guy, he beat us. And they say this, Behold, the whole world is gone after him. If only the whole world has gone after Jesus. But for them, it was enough that they have decided the only way we're going to be able to deal with this is if he's not here anymore. Remember, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And if he really is king, not even death is going to stop him. We serve the risen Savior. So we go from John chapter 12. If you would, please turn uh, over to Mark probably kind of tricky. I just thought about this. If you're used to using your phone, it's kind of tricky. So it might be best to have a Bible in your lap for this. It'd be tough to watch a YouTube video and have the Bible app open at the same time. I'm sure you have a Bible you can follow along. If not, you can certainly listen. It's possible you're watching this at a place where you don't have your Bible open. That's fine. I'll read the verses for you. So Mark chapter 11 I want you to see, if, if you can look in your Bible, you'll see Mark 11, the first 11 verses, the first 10 verses. This is Palm Sunday, which we just finished yesterday. Verse 11, Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And I want to point this out. When he looked round about upon all the things. So he goes into the temple after they've laid down palm branches, shouted Hosanna. He's made his way in. Um, it says that he goes into the temple. He doesn't do anything there, but he just looks around the temple again. Now, Jesus has been to the temple several times over the last three years, but he gets a fresh look at it one more time because today, that was yesterday. Today, he's going back to the temple for a very specific reason. So you'll see Mark chapter 11, Jesus entered into Jerusalem, into the temple on Sunday, which is the first day of the week. And when he looked round about upon all the things 
And now the even tide was come. It's starting to get dark. Remember, they've got a two-mile walk back to Bethany. He went out unto Bethany with the 12. They go back for the night. So they walk the two miles back to Bethany. That's Sunday night. He sleeps there with his friends. Then, verse number 12, Mark eleven twelve, 12. And on the morrow, so now it's Monday, second day of the week, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. So they're walking from Bethany. They're headed back toward Jerusalem again. And he's going there for a specific reason. Remember, at the end of Palm Sunday, he's looked around. He's hungry. In verse 13, seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves. So it looks like it's alive and in fruit season. He came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. Kind of an unusual moment, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. They come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and he began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold the doves. This is Monday. Now, if you're thinking, wait a second, I thought Jesus did this at the beginning of his ministry. You're not wrong. Jesus actually cleansed the temple twice. In John chapter 2, when Jesus first started his three-year ministry, because he started at age 30, and he served for three Passovers uh, there in the Jerusalem area, traveled spreading the gospel, healing, all of those things. In John 2, at the beginning of his ministry, he went in and cleansed the temple. Now, when he did it that time, that's when he made the scourge of cords. Um, if you read it, he's super aggressive when that occurred. I mean, it says that he whipped the animals out of there. You can even make a case that that whipping could have been with some of the money changers as well. Um, but Jesus is very angry and, um, and he throws the tables over. He chases them all out. And then immediately after that happens, the Pharisees say, whoa, who do you think you are? By what authority do you do this? And he says, by this authority, tear this temple down in three days and I'll build it back up again. They go on to say for 40 and six years was this temple being built. And you think you're going to do that all in three days, not understanding that he was prophesying that in three years he'd be put to death and then he would raise from the dead. Talking about the temple of his body. That's all in John chapter two. But when we read in Mark chapter 11, um, on Monday when he goes up uh, to Jerusalem, this one's a little bit different and I'll show it to you. So he comes into Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple. Now you understand why at the end of yesterday, he went up and looked at the temple. He was making his plan. That's important and I'll show you why. So he goes in after he had checked it out the day before and he began to cast them, uh, cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and he overthrew the tables of the money changers, the seats of them that sold doves. And he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple, which was a shortcut. We're not going to take a lot of time, but, but there was a shortcut that you could make to get from one side of the city to the other. The temple was at a very central location. And so to carry vessels of water or whatever it was to the marketplace, there was, you know, the working quarters over here and the regular city quarters in the marketplace. And so to get from one side to the other, you could cut through the temple. So Jesus first dumps over the tables of the people trying to make money off of worship. And then the people that would belittle worship, he cuts them off and he says, go around. You're not cutting through my father's house. And so he won't let anyone come through. And in verse 17, he taught, saying unto them, it is not written. Is it not written? My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it the den of thieves. This is why this one's different. In John chapter 2, he has an argument with the Pharisees and then he leaves. But in Mark chapter 11, verse 17, and you can look at it in two other texts as well. You can look at it in Matthew 21 and in Luke 19. Uh, they're all synced together describing this event. Um, he sits down and he teaches them. And he starts off, he blows the place up. I think sometimes you'll hear me on Sundays, blow the place up. And years ago, there was a family that had been attending and they stopped attending. And, you know, I didn't know why. And someone finally said, you know, they just said that you're just a little too rambunctious and aggressive for them. And I was flattered by that because 
Jesus was gentle, but at times he was pretty rambunctious too. And so the zeal of the Lord hath eaten him up. That's what scripture says when it talks about how he dumped over the temple. And if I find, a, find us in a complacent place, I have no problem doing that as well. Um, but he, um, he, he came in throwing tables, but then he sat down and he began to teach them. In fact, he taught them all day. In verse 18, it says, And the scribes and the chief priests heard it. They sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all of the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. He spent all day at the temple. John spends a little bit of time talking about he, how he sat down with the, with the Greeks, not the Jews, but the Greeks. They came in and he gave them the gospel. And so I don't want you to miss this. Remember, he set up his own triumphal entry. He called out the colt that he would ride in and miraculously used an animal that didn't belong to him and he didn't have the money to purchase. He rode into the city, goes up to the temple, checks everything out and comes back out. That was so successful, the Pharisees have concluded, we can't stop this guy. Then when he comes back, he dumps over the table, but then he sits down and teaches them. All of this, don't miss this was on purpose. He knew that he would make them angry and that that would cause them to want to kill them, kill him. And he did it all on purpose. So know that as we look through all of the events, and it's, I can't comprehend the strain that must have been on Jesus, knowing that these are his very last days. And he's not just going to die, but the way that he's going to die. And yet, all of it's on purpose. How awesome is that? And so as we move into Monday, the week is on purpose and he has dumped over the tables on purpose and he has made a stir on purpose because he wants to die for us on purpose. Don't ever call Christ a victim of the cross. Dear Jesus, thank you for this study that you've laid before us. As we move through the week, we pray that you would bless us with these studies. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.